Wow. <laughs> That's pretty nice. <laughs> Put it on? Sure. Oh, it came off the, the ribbon. You speak, I'll see if I can fix it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, John. You're always giving me these nice awards. It's true. <laughs> I really appreciate them. And thank you, Anne, for all these years of introducing me and saying very nice things about me. And congratulations, Mitchell. I wish I could check out your bookshop, but uh, long may you thrive. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, my acceptance speech was unaccustomed as I am to public speaking. Here goes, anyway. In Jean Cocteau's 1950 movie, Orpheus, the title character is a modern poet whose poems are dictated to him by a voice on his car radio. He journeys to hell in order to bring back his missing wife, Eurydice. While there he is interrogated by three sinister judges who ask him, among other things, what he does. He answers that he is a poet. When one of the judges replies, what does that mean? Orpheus says, it means to write and not be a writer. This distinction holds generally true, I think. For instance, in the title of the contemporary magazine that deals with issues of writing and publishing called Poets and Writers. <laughs> As it happens, the current number has an article by Ellen Sussman about what writers should reply when asked at a party, what do you do? <laughs> she says, you write because it's your passion, your lifeblood, and yet you tell this lovely person that you're an accountant, a house husband, a cowpoke. Repeat after me, Ms. Sussman says, I'm a writer, it's my job, it's what I do. That's fine if you are a writer, say a novelist like her, but what if you're a poet? He would never reply, I'm a poet, <laughs> out, of out of fear that your interlocutor would get up and leave the room. <laughs> it sounds like you're conferring value on yourself. You can't be a poet who calls himself or herself a poet without leaving open the possibility that you're a bad poet. <laughs> so you're stuck with the situation of writing and not being a writer. If this sounds like whining, let me add hastily that I'm quite pleased with my status in the world of writers. I've been lucky enough to get concrete signs of appreciation over the years. One of them arrived 35 years ago when I got the National Book Award. <clears throat> but even without them, I think I would have continued writing just for the, well, fun of it, because it is fun, though it isn't supposed to be. If it wasn't, I would have taken up some alternate pursuit years ago needlepoint or designing miniature golf courses. <laughs> but writing the poetry I write gives me a pleasure I can almost taste. One I can imagine a pianist must feel practicing in solitude, but never alone thanks to this strange experience that is emerging in him. Of course, it's hard to write, but somehow the difficulty is embedded in the pleasure. Besides the vexatious pleasure of writing and not being a writer, there is a further concern for me in that to many people, intelligent and honest ones among them, what I write makes no sense. <laughs> it apparently lacks accessibility, a relatively recent requirement. <laughs> when I first discovered modern poetry at the age of about 16, I was delighted by its difficulty, a word often used since then in discussions of my work and in general, by what Yeats calls the fascination of what's difficult. My first encounter with Gertrude Stein, for instance, inspired me to instant feats of imitation. 
She's so great, she's so hard to understand, might have summed up my initiation. Wait, my, my reaction. Several years later, my advisor at Harvard, they called them tutors, just as they call the dormitories houses, a bit of inverse snobbery, assigned me Henry James, The Wings of the Dove, the first book of his I'd come upon. Once again, I tore through it delightedly. Wow, this is really difficult, I thought. <laughs> Contemporaneous was my discovery of the poetry of Eliot, Stevens, and the gnomic early Auden, all of whom became important influences. My early poetry, I thought, was in the grand modern tradition of being hard to understand. Besides, wasn't this what modern art was all about? Picasso painted heads with three eyes, and viewers looked on with equanimity. Stravinsky had four pianists banging the same chord over and over in Les Nos, <clears throat> and audiences were enthralled. It wasn't until I began to publish some years later that I realized I had trespassed. It was okay for those godlike figures to traffic in difficulty I was given to understand, but my own stuff was just a little too difficult, in fact, a lot too difficult, ranking somewhere near root canal on the pleasure principle scale. <laughs> Besides, by then, difficulty was out, accessibility was in. These thoughts dawned anew a few days ago when wondering what I would say tonight, I happened to glance at the acceptance speech I wrote on getting the National Book Award in 1976. I didn't happen to glance at it. I searched for it <laughs> diligently on the internet. <laughs> for as long as I have been publishing poetry, it has been criticized as difficult and private, though I never meant for it to be. At least I wanted its privateness to suggest the ways in which all of us are private and alone in the sense Proust meant when he said, each of us is truly alone. And I wanted the difficulty to reflect the difficulty of reading, any kind of reading, which is both a pleasant and painful experience since we are temporarily giving ourselves to something which may change us. I seem to have been writing out of this situation for many years, including in a fairly recent poem called Uptick, which has the lines, to come back for a few hours to the present subject, a painting looking like it was seen, half turning around, slightly apprehensive, but it has to pay attention to what's up ahead, a vision. Therefore, poetry dissolves in brilliant moisture and reads us to us, a faint notion. Too many words, but precious. So the dilemma hasn't gone away, but then, I console myself, neither have I yet. I'm still writing and still not a writer. The pleasure that comes from writing is as sharp as ever. So, alas, is the fear of giving offense to readers whom I wish to please by offering them a nice surprise. A nice one, but still a surprise, and I'm aware that not everybody likes surprises. Still, tonight's Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters, a huge surprise, makes me feel the past few decades haven't actually been wasted. And this is a terrific feeling. Thank you all very much. And thanks especially to those who have helped me achieve it, including my editors of long standing, Elizabeth Sifton and Dan Halpern, my agent of 40 years, George Borchardt, and my partner of 41, David Kermani. You done good. Thank you.